Well, welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we are joined by Jonathan Gray in New Zealand. And of course, his website is beforeus.com. And before us, lots of things are going on. The uh, star signs in the heavens literally declared the glory of the Most High God, as it says in the Bible. Uh, we have the blood moons now, which talk about the uh, the sun darkened by sackcloth and the moon turned blood, which is the penumbrum, or the main part of the total eclipse that occurs when the red light's not as bent as much as the blue light, and the, and the moon then gets light in, infused on it that actually makes it look like blood, or makes it look like Mars, I guess, <laughs> the red planet. Uh, those are specific signs. These ones, the tetrad, which occurred last night, I stayed up late to do it, and a little sleep today, but I got my son to make me one of these espresso coffees, which I usually don't drink, so coffee to me is like four coffees to anybody else. <laughs> so I'm wide awake now, and I can tell you that uh, you want to be awake for what's going to happen. Uh, let's go through the rest now of the uh, Forbidden Secret, which is the prophecies that deal with the resurrection and the fact of the nature of the reality of our universe. So this is written re literally in the stars and also in the coming of Yeshua, HaMashiach, in the first time and the second time where the ultimate nature of mankind will be revealed. So, uh, Jonathan, let's continue. Okay, we're on the resurrection. Yes. Uh, well, for, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to stress the importance of the resurrection, Dr. Bill, that, and it's very important, as, as we know, but there are some people out there probably who don't, uh, it hasn't clicked just how vital this is to our future, the actual event of the resurrection. Firstly, it placed a seal on the genuineness of certain Old Testament prophecies, uh, for example, in Psalms, Hosea, and so on. Secondly, it placed a seal on Jesus as being who and what he claimed to be. Uh, thirdly, the resurrection proved Jesus' inherent power, and it marked him as the conqueror of death. And fifthly, unless it happened, we are still without hope beyond the grave, Bill, uh, because uh, unless he has the keys of death, we have no hope of getting out ourselves. So it's very, very important. Absolutely. Now, so let's continue. Yeah. Uh, now, what about the, uh, the tomb that was burst open? Um, a, a good part of my work in recent years has been uh, the investigation of the, the archaeological side of things, and maybe it would be of interest to share the fact that this is real. When you get something that you can touch and you can see it, in some cases you can smell it, uh, you are looking at reality. You're not looking at uh, conjured up stories of the past or something that might be true or may not be true. Uh, I'd like to share this more today, Bill, the, uh, the archaeological story of, of how we were involved and what we discovered that actually proves that this was a supernatural event, and archaeology can prove it. Now... Yeah. The, the New Testament tells us that Jesus was crucified outside the city at a place called a skull, and a skull, of course, translates in Latin to Calvary and in Aramaic to Golgotha. Now, there's only one place in Jerusalem which has borne and still bears the name Skull Hill. It's just outside the north wall of the old city. It's about 250 yards northeast of the Damascus Gate. And a portion of the hill still bears a striking resemblance to a human skull. And uh, it's also now become a traditional site for burial for Muslims, Jews and Christians. And according to local tradition, our criminals here were stoned to death. And in the Jewish Mishnah, this place is called Beth ha Sekila, literally House of Stoning. And nearby, you've got St. Stephen's Church, which was built over an old basilica that was erected to commemorate the stoning of Stephen. Uh, Stephen, as we know, was the first Christian martyr here, 34 AD. And it was the recognized place of execution for Jewish criminals. Uh, in fact, as late as uh, the beginning of the 20th century, Jews would spit at the hill, throw stones, and curse what they called the destroyer of their nation. And it's such a site that the Roman authorities would have selected also for executions. Now, it's the, the Damascus Gate that leads to it is the only direct exit from the castle of Antonine, the alleged place of Jesus' illegal north tri trial. And uh, 
Recent archaeological opinion also holds that the Damascus Gate, which today marks the northern boundary of the old city, also marks the northern boundary of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus' crucifixion. So this tends to add weight to the feasibility of Skull Hill outside the wall that was even suggested by uh, illustrious uh, people of the past, uh, including General Gordon. General Gordon is that famous um, soldier of Britain who uh, spent a lot of time in the Middle East. And uh, we, we might note in passing that uh, there's a large complex of Jewish tombs dating from the First and Second Temple periods to the left of it. Uh, and uh, there you'll find also what's known as the Garden Tomb, which uh, we now are convinced Jesus was buried here. Uh, the quarried face actually uh, extends from the skull face past the crucifixion site, past into the area of the Garden Tomb. It's all connected together. Now, um, an American team from 1979 to January 1982 worked in front of that uh, Skull Hill and they found a crucifixion platform and uh, they found four squarish holes. The holes actually are about 12 to 13 inches square, cut down into the bedrock about two feet and uh, one of the holes, one of those four holes is elevated above the rest, which means that there were three lower down and then one placed higher up. And as we know from the scripture, there were to be three criminals executed that day. One was Barabbas and there were two others. And when the crowd called out free Barabbas and crucify Jesus, Jesus took Barabbas's place. Now, uh, it's interesting that there had been 11 attempts on Jesus' life, we get from the Gospels, during his ministry, but the time had not yet come. The appointed time was not yet. And so when they did have Jesus in their hands, and this was the appointed time ordained by God, they wanted to elevate him as the star attraction, the great arc criminal of all. And so instead of putting him down on the level of the other three, of, the, of those three, they drilled a hole four feet higher up, and although he was placed in the middle between two thieves, he was a little bit further back and higher up than them because he was the star attraction, the, the big prize that they'd been trying to get for three years, and now they had him, Dr. Bill. Right. So it's interesting that these holes are still there. They were, they were preserved by the rubble of 2,000 years, and when they were uncovered, uh, in the cliff face, there were plaques, three plaques, which would correspond, of course, to the fact that Jesus had uh, signs placed over his head. doesn't say they were placed on his head or on the cross, but it does say they were placed above his head in the scripture. And above his head, if he was on the cross, you would see these three plaques, one in Latin, one in Hebrew, one in uh, Greek, testifying that he was the, uh, the man that they were crucifying and who he was. And that was a warning. The Romans tell us that they used to crucify victims on public thoroughfares where a lot of people were passing by, not on tops of hills as sometimes our artists picture Jesus' crucifixion, not on the top of the hill at all, no. Down in the front of the hill on a, on a crucifixion platform where passers-by could look at him and shake their heads and spit at him. Right. And that's exactly where he was and that's what has been found there. Very interesting. interesting. Yeah. Now, in the holes, there were plugs placed. We'll get on ah, to that in a moment. Keep that thought when we come back, and uh, we'll continue with the amazing historical, archaeological facts about the crucifixion resurrection and the nature of reality and who and what Yeshua was, God in the flesh, and who we are, his children. Back in a moment. Set dates and times, but we're in the uh, last year of the uh, of the cycle, and this last year is going to is going to end on September 28, 2015. It's called the Shemitah year. Uh, it means that uh, the tribulation can only start after the Shemitah year is completed. That means after the 28th of February, uh, sorry of of, uh, of September uh, 2015. 
Uh, I can't set dates, but I can tell you that the first possible date uh, will have to be on a Feast of Tabernacles because the temple can only be sanctified and a blood sacrifice started with the partitioning of the state of Israel and the city uh, the, and the Temple Mount allowing the blood sacrifice to start the inauguration of a temple which has already been approved last fall in Israel uh, after September 28, 2015. Uh, I think that the current war that started today in Ukraine with Russia and the Ukrainian uh, rogue government attacking eastern Ukraine with citizens being attacked by jets and, and tanks uh, is going to explode and the Russians will crush them. They'll take over all the other former Soviet republics and uh, Europe and America can do nothing to stop them. And uh, I think what you're going to see is a peace treaty will come out of it because we'll be coming right to the brink of a third world war and uh, people need to start kind of getting their, themselves straight with God that we have the false prophet which is Obama we have the beast dictator, which is Putin, and we have the final pope, which is Pope Francis. These are the final guys. This is the curtain call is now about to happen. Uh, when we're looking at this blood moon last night, the first of the last four tetrads, this is very significant. So let's continue. Okay. Uh, we were talking, Dr. Bill, about the, the four cross holes there. There were not three, there were four. Right. And... Uh, uh, once they were uncovered, there were found to be stone plugs set in each of them. Now, I guess the obvious use of preventing the holes from filling up when not in use, as well as preventing people and horses from breaking their legs. Then, after the removal of further debris, one of the cross holes was measured and found to extend down 23 and a half inches into the solid bedrock. Wow. Now, uh, this crucifixion site up against the Calvary escarpment, close to the place of the skull, north of the Damascus Gate, on a ledge facing toward the public road, uh, was the perfect place for execution. And continued clearing of this area exposed a portion of a large, flat rock. Now, the rock itself was a little less than two feet thick. Uh, that's a, I'd just like us to remember that measurement, just a little less than two feet thick and the exposed edge was curved, something like a large, thick, rounded tabletop. And as the team cleared away more dirt and debris, it became apparent that the stone was enormous. So they stopped digging. The, the dirt and the debris over it was about 10 feet deep. And it would be some time before its true dimensions were determined by subsurface radar from above the ground. And the diameter of the stone was found to be 13 feet two inches. Now that's another measurement to remember because we'll get back to that in a moment. And a building had apparently been constructed at one time to enclose both the crucifixion and the great round stone. So what was the significance of this stone at the crucifixion site? Right. Now the New Testament describes a nearby garden which contained a newly cut out tomb of a wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. We, we have descendants of Joseph of Arimathea living very close to us here, Dr. Bill, right here in New Zealand. Right. Uh, they trace right. their ancestry right back to him. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And anyway, the New Testament says that the owner of the tomb, Joseph, had witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus. He went to the governor, Pontius Pilate, to ask for Jesus' body to be placed in his, that's Joseph's, own new tomb, and the request right. was granted. And there they laid Jesus. So here we have a three-strand link. We've got the Skull Hill crucifixion site, we've got a surrounding garden, and we've got a nearby tomb. And uh, in 1867, in the same cliff face, not far from the crucifixion site, a landowner was digging a cistern on his property when he discovered a tomb cut into the cliff face. And this was on the same level as the crucifixion site. And uh, a cistern, of course, was used for, for gardens, for water supply. And there's evidence that there had been a garden around this whole site. Now, of course, the discovery of a tomb here could hardly be described as sensational because many tombs have been found in this large ancient area. But this tomb is of special interest. Uh, in 1883, General Gordon, a notable British Army uh, leader, came to the area and became convinced that the skull face was the true Golgotha. Well, 
he's now been proved right. So he went looking for a tomb nearby and he found this very same tomb. But it wasn't excavated for several years. Now, we do know that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre inside the Jewish, uh, the old Jewish wall area had been built by the Roman Emperor Constantine in 333 AD and today that's where the site that Catholics bring tourists to and claim this is the site of Jesus' burial but um, it doesn't, it's inside the wall, it's inside the wall of the first century so that doesn't fit the Bible description. No. It had to be outside. Anyway, once the excavation of the tomb was completed, characteristics showed that it was a tomb of the first century from the time of Jesus. <clears throat> and Kathleen Kenyon, the, the British archaeologist, um, made her assessment of that as well. Anyway, what we have today is a first century tomb, uh, but we need better evidence than that. Now, according to John, Matthew and Luke, the tomb of Joseph had special characteristics. First, it was near the crucifixion site. Secondly, it was in a garden. Thirdly, it was carved out of the rock. Fourthly, it was a rich man's tomb. Now, I'll just pause there for a moment. As you go into the tomb, you're impressed by its size. Certainly, only a rich man could have afforded a tomb like this. Inside the tomb, you have two cubicles. One on the right is for the owner of the tomb to be laid and close to that for his wife. And then there's a large room on the left cut out for the mourners to stand. Only a rich man could have afforded such a tomb, so that fits too. Now, we're told that the doorway, through the doorway you could look into the tomb from outside. And that is so today. There was standing room for a number of persons, according to Luke, inside the tomb. And we find that to be true. It was a new tomb and not an old tomb renewed. Now, how do we know this is a new tomb? This is interesting. Uh, we have evidence that this tomb that we're looking at here was not used by the man who cut it out for himself. And what's this evidence? Now, inside the tomb, you've got one section carved out of the rock to fit one man but then it was suddenly enlarged very roughly to fit a, a taller man. We've got evidence that it was hacked out another six inches after the original one had been completed. Welcome back, and uh, Jonathan Gray, let's continue. You know, God knows the end from the beginning, and, and God resides in the eternal now, the place beyond time and space. When we talk about salvation, it's really quite simple. Uh, there's three parts to a person. There's the spirit, which is part of God himself, the eternal one. There's the soul, which is literally uh, the non-physical portion of what you are. It's the portion where your intelligence resides. It's not in your brain, it resides in your soul. And there's in the physical body, which is connected through the cord of living waters, to the they call it the silver cord in the book of Genesis. And it's um, interesting, what really happens in salvation is the eternal part of you, which is God, fuses with your soul because you come into the will of the Most High God uh, and you hear and do Shema, God's will, and you go from being a mortal soul to becoming an immortal one, which means at the moment of salvation you have no past, present, and future because a portion of you, which is the Creator, makes you an eternal one. That's why you receive, in a sense, the, you hear about the story about the Melchizedek priesthood. It's a process of salvation where you go from being a mortal being to an immortal one. And that's why when God gives gifts, he gives a portion of his omniscience and omnipotence as a sign gift to show that he has children that have the right to have the signet ring of the Creator God and to do his will because they are in perfect alignment with his will. Uh, the source of all goodness, all love, and all protection. And uh, he's coming back soon because the world as it's been run into the ground right now by Satan and his minions, and we can see with all our politicians, all our, I call our media like Hollywood, I call Hollywood, and uh, the financial system, it's all converging to a great catastrophe, and literally today, the war in Ukraine has started. So, I think that this is going to devolve into a peace treaty, will temporarily hold back the fire. Uh, as it says, it's going to be sealed for half an hour, and of course the hour is the hour of tribulation, or the Jacob's trouble, which is going to start very shortly. Uh, that time of Jacob's trouble starts literally 
only by rabbinic law on the Feast of Tabernacles, and that means it's coming up very soon, probably as early as next year, 2015. But we won't set dates. What we can say is that God's timing is eternal, and he's doing this to save the Sabbatane Satanistic Jews, which currently populate much of Israel, uh, that gives them a chance to, rec to uh, recompense, because Israel is a rogue nation. It's been very dangerous because it's run by Sabbatane Satanists who, by and large, at least half of the Jews at the time of Shabtaitzvi and Yaakov Frank became full-blood Satanists. And they follow these anti-Messiahs and they literally run the world. They run America into the ground, actually. And they probably involve directly with the flight, uh, Malaysia Flight 370, stealing technology because they worship technology to rule the world. Uh, it's a very dangerous situation, but God is going to bring back the Jews as it says in the Bible, one-third will be saved out of the circumstances, and they will see the one they have pierced. And the one they have pierced, we're talking about today on the Forbidden Secret, uh, this is very real. Uh, technology is not your salvation, and this is a message for Ray Kurzweil and other transhumanists. You're not going to create a new cybernetic version of yourself. You're not going to have a transcendence like Johnny Depp in the current coming movie. Uh, so it's important. Let's continue uh, to develop this, because people need to understand that we already are, when we hear and do God's will, eternal winds. And in heaven starts today, hell, which is eternal separation from God and the fire of that burning lasts forever, continues at the moment of the physical death of the body when the soul starts to die, but it takes forever. Okay, getting to getting uh, Bill to the, um, the, the physical continuation of uh, where Jesus was laid, Yes. Uh, we, we, everything we're talking that you're talking about depends on, on the reality of this, doesn't it? Because if he didn't rise, then we, we don't have an eternal life. Well, Fact it also explains the nature of reality. See, his resurrection actually is God's final statement of, I am God, I, I, I lay the plumb line for the universe, for time and space, which God is beyond. And when he physically resurrected, he demonstrated that he was the fullness of the creator God, as it says, Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah. And when we understand that, he's also saying, he's talking about the resurrection of us, which means a portion of eternity fuses with our soul, and we go from being a mortal being to being immortal. And this is made possible by Jesus Christ himself and what he's done. Exactly. Yeah, and only by him. We could only not by do him. it. And by the way, he, our blood, which is our life, when we we're a bond servant, when we we're a son or daughter, uh, literally is joined to the blood of the sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice of the Creator God, who makes it right with himself because he cannot tolerate disobedience, he cannot tolerate error, he cannot tolerate ignorance. Yep. So, uh, in the tomb, uh, we've got evidence, uh, Dr. Bill, that it was enlarged for someone's feet. Now, it was enlarged for somebody who was about six inches taller than Joseph himself. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. and we know yeah, that was Jesus a, was taller. Yeah, he was a big man. When I died at eight and a half, I met him, I would say that he looked like a tall, olive-colored skinned Viking would be the best way to describe him. And he was a big, muscular man. He was like at least over six foot tall. And the average, of course, per Middle Eastern person at the time was probably around 5'4 or 5'5. Five five. So he was a big man. Yeah. Anyway, the existence of this cavity in, in the receptacle for the body at the tomb's northeast corner, inside the tomb, and the absence of this cavity in the southeast receptacle, and the unfinished groove toward the north end of the of the wall show clearly that the tomb was never completed. And the Bible says that uh, it was a new tomb, not an old tomb renewed. So once again, this tomb qualifies. Now, the, the eighth uh, indication is that the tomb was closed by rolling a great stone over the entrance. And the emphasis is on great. Yeah. And... Uh, it's another evidence, of course, that the owner of the tomb was a rich man. Now, uh, immediately in front of the tomb is a stone trench or trough. And this is for the rolling of a stone to seal well, the there's doorway. A special, there's a special name for that stone, too. What is it called? Well, a, a, different names are given. I, I call it the seal stone. Yeah, the seal stone. That's a good term. Now, um, I'd like to spend the rest of our, our time together, the time that I'm on with you, talking about the stone because it's an exciting detective uh, thriller, you might say. Uh -huh. And it, it glorifies the fact of Jesus' resurrection. Now, we've got the stone trench 
the stone trough for the rolling of a stone to seal the doorway. At the left end is an incline, a little higher, from which the stone was rolled onto the trough at the right-hand side of the incline. Now, I took an archaeological team to Jerusalem on this particular occasion, and we measured the trough which was built to channel the rolling stone. And we found this trough to be, now wait for this, just uh, over two feet wide. Did we speak Whoa. of something that was two feet wide before? Now that means that the stone is going to be weighing probably at least three or four tons. And more. Yeah, <laughs> at least. Now... That's a big stone. This is not rolled by, beside by one man who's, uh, this is rolled beside by many or supernaturally by angels. Yeah. Now that two feet, remember I said to remember the two feet that went at the crucifixion site of a stone. At the right hand of the trough is a large stone block positioned to prevent further movement of the seal stone toward the right. And above that, on the right hand face of the tomb itself is a ridge cut into the rock which would block this it's it's a circular ridge the shape of the edge of a stone to block the stone from rolling further in that direction to the right now in the face of the tomb we found two evidences which showed that a very very large seal stone was once used to seal this tomb uh, on the right side of the tomb face a team member, Dr. Nathan Meyer from America, had on an earlier visit pointed out a hole that was pierced into the cliff face, and the hole held the oxidised remains of an iron shaft. Uh, and this has since been removed, but the hole remains. On the left-hand side of the tomb face, another hole had been pierced into the rock for the insertion of a metal shaft to prevent the seal stone being rolled to the left and the tomb being open. And uh, I'll tell you what we found. Wow. Amazing, amazing. So lots of technical details that show that this is quite an amazing stone. We're back in a moment with Jonathan Gray. Hell about it, but years before he died when I was only 14. But I never got a chance to get it. I heard it from my other relatives, but it's difficult to get a hold of it. But the documents exist, which is interesting. How, how wonderful would be welcome, this? Welcome back, and uh, Johnson, let's continue. So these the evidence of this stone and the other uh, physics of it actually proves the resurrection, which is interesting that science can prove it, and that makes sense, because you, you yes. take something and prove that it is beyond the laws of physics, which means a supernatural intervention had to occur to create that situation. That's right, and I'd, I'd just like to explain how that is, because uh, it, it do definitely does. Now, um, Team, uh, myself and team members, David Wagner and Peter Mutton, David from America, Peter Mutton from Australia, measured across the tomb face from the shaft hole on the, on the left that was there to hold the stone on the left to the ridge on the right that was meant to hold the stone on the right. And we discovered the distance to be precisely 13 feet 2 inches. Now, didn't we mention a stone at the crucifixion site that was just under 2 feet thick and was 13 feet 2 inches in diameter? Uh, yes, exactly. So here we've got the, the, the trough, which is just over 2 feet thick, and we've got the distance of the pegs to hold the stone, both sides, a distance of precisely 13 feet 2 inches between them. And wow. this shows, this shows that the seal stone was indeed, as the scripture says, a very great stone. Now, to our knowledge, the largest steel stone found before this was five foot six inches. So this was more than twice the size of the next largest one that has been found in Israel. But the size of the stone at the crucifixion site and the size of the stone at the burial site are a perfect match. Wow. Now, I'd like to share something very intriguing. We photographed and videotaped the spot where the Romans drove the iron shaft into the stone face of the tomb on the left side, where the 13-foot steel stone would have been. Now, they'd done this in an attempt to prevent the stone from being rolled to the side and the tomb being open. And the metal shaft on the left, which held the stone in place, was about two fingers in thickness. It would be impossible to bend this iron shaft, much less snap it off, 
simply by pushing the steel stone against it. To move the great stone even one inch, the shaft must first be taken out. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. However, when we examined the hole that held the metal shaft, we found that the shaft was still in there. What was left of it, that is. It had been sheared off, level with the wall, and the appearance of the metal was consistent with it having been sheared off when struck with a tremendous force from the right-hand side. Now, an engineer friend of mine calculated that the sheer strength of the peg was approximately 60 to 80 tonnes. To put it another way, a metal plug of such thickness could withstand 60 to 80 tonnes pressure before it finally snapped off. Wow. Now, you imagine, you imagine 10 tip trucks all compressed together, or all the materials of two brick houses squeezed together and suddenly dropped onto the iron peg. That's the pressure you would need. However, being soft and malleable, the peg might have taken more than that because it would first bend before it sheared right off. And the engineer confirmed my conclusion, and he, he, he actually wrote this for me so that I could always quote it if I needed to. He said, I could see that the end had been torn slightly sideways, the end of the peg, perhaps right. a quarter inch to the left, even though it was now rusted some. It was an incredible sight to witness what had happened accomplished by moving the stone in one simple move. Now, he calculated that the stone itself weighed around 13.8 tonnes, the stone itself. And it would be impossible, humanly speaking, to snap off that metal peg from a dead stop because there was no leverage. Right. However, the seal stone was gone. We now find it at the crucifixion site. Someone pushed the stone aside without taking out the metal peg. And the question is, who was it? Humanly speaking, it was totally impossible. Right. Well, we go to the Gospel of Matthew, and it says that the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone. And the evidence shows that the stone was moved with great speed by some colossal force without taking out the peg. Wow. Now, I ask, could that sheared off metal shaft still visible in the wall be evidence of a supernatural opening of the tomb? Is this a physical witness to the miraculous resurrection of Jesus? And I would say that here we have the laws of physics and the science of archaeology coming to confirm the resurrection. Now, we went to the police department because a critic said that the iron peg uh, was no more than a stray bullet that hit the wall during the 1967 wall. So we had to investigate that. Uh, so we asked the police department, <clears throat> what would happen if you fired a bullet into the stone cliff? Would it embed into the wall? He said, no, it might shatter a hole in the stone wall, but it would not fix itself into it. Now we advance further. We go to the, the Antiquities Department, the IAA in Israel, in Israel Antiquities Authority. And they began to test it for us. And they released the information. And the IAA archaeologist, uh, Yehil Zillinger, wrote a short article stating that the metal object found in the wall of the garden tomb was consistent with metal pins used in Roman construction. And he stated that samples taken from the object were tested at the Hebrew University and shown to contain both iron and lead. Now, why the lead? Well, it was a common practice in ancient times to set metal pins in molten lead, and this would make them easier to drive into solid rock objects. Wow. Now, while these tests do not determine the date of the metal object, they do show a consistency with metal pegs used to construct the Colosseum in Rome and with those found in other Roman period sites of the time of Jesus. So here's the bottom line, Dr. Bill. The findings are consistent with my conclusion that this metal pin was used by the Romans to seal the garden tomb. The metal pin is not shrapnel from an exploded shell of 1967, nor a stray bullet. It is of ancient Roman origin of the first century. So once again, let me ask this question. Could this then be archae direct archaeological evidence of the supernatural shearing off of the peg to wall level? as the seal stone was superhumanly rolled at high speed against it 
is this archaeological evidence of the resurrection event? That's the question I leave. Yeah, I would think so. this is the only logical conclusion you can make. And of course, it also it, these signs were left there so other historians, even that are not Jewish or Christian, would be able to make the statement <clears throat> that there were number one signs that Jesus was seen after the resurrection, and that these historical signs that there were supernatural events that happened, there was a great earthquake that happened during the blood moon, which happened to occur right at the time of the of the crucifixion as well. It's interesting that the Pesha was a was a basically a full lunar eclipse occurred at the same time as the earthquake. Isn't it interesting? Yes, there's something else interesting, Dr. Bill. When the sun was darkened, there was no eclipse of the sun. No. Because the sun and the moon were in the opposite parts of the sky. <clears throat> right. Just like they are at the moment, mm. and on full moon. And so that blackening out of the sun, which the scripture speaks of at the death of Jesus, was a supernatural event that cannot be explained by any, any eclipse. It was impossible right. to be an eclipse. Exactly, yeah. But there was a lunar eclipse occurring then. The lunar eclipse uh, usually occurs around about the middle of the month, which would, would strike Passover time, either the day before Passover, the day after, or the day of Passover. I do right. remember that the last century, we have 100 years in a century, 37 of those occurred on Passover day, of the eclipses. You have an eclipse once a year in the Passover month. Yeah, exactly. And, and you, you have Passover occurring at the same time as an eclipse, if, if the eclipse is occurring at the middle of the month. So, um, and now with this amazing data, what do atheists say when you present this information to them? What are they, how do they explain that way? Uh, the most common reaction is silence, because what can they think of to say? What can, how can they rebut it? Exactly, yeah. And I believe that for all the Christians, that have been martyred or served God in the last 2,000 years. Many of us have already ruled and reigned with the Most High God for 2,000 years, a double portion of grace. And the time of trouble is coming very quickly. We can see that happening with Israel planning war against Syria and Iran. We can see Russia re-exerting its power as the rise of the now uh, b Russian bear refurbishes its military force, enters Ukraine, and they were forced to by the West, by the way, this is also set up to crash the world economy to bring about a reboot, which we call the mark or authentication world currency. All of it's happening in our day. It's very real, and it's now. Thank you, Jonathan Gray. Amazing update for Passover.